Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that you may think women are complaining about nothing when they talk about smells, but new research shows that women actually smell better than men do. And this could affect women's emotional associations and their emotions, and it's probably because women have 50% more neurons in the olfactory bulbs of their brains than us men do. Uh, we don't really know why, but you could guess that it has to do with the way women pick mates for reproduction. The guy has to smell compatible, so you'd have to have good smell uh, receptors in order to do that, which is kind of cool. If you haven't had a chance yet to check out the Zentech filters that we make, I'd love it if you took a second and looked at the iPhone or computer that you're probably listening to this on, and realize that if you look at that at night, it's affecting your sleep quality. The Zentec filter filters out only the narrowest spectrum of blue light that's most impactful, so you can still use it during the day. I've had the thing on my phone for a long time, so when I set the alarm at night, the phone isn't gonna take me out of my melatonin zone. Zentec filters on the Bulletproof site. Check it out and support the show, thank you. Today's guest is best known for being the co-creator of Living Libations, which is a line of serums and essential oils that you can use on your skin. And she's the author of a couple books, including the recent one that I really enjoyed called Holistic Dental Care, The Complete Guide to Healthy Teeth and Gums. Now, some of you may read like Tom Clancy or something, but like, I'm telling you, like I, I don't read that kind of stuff. Actually, I do sometimes, but this is a really good book. And I do read that kind of book with regular frequency because it's really neat. And there's a lot of good stuff in, uh, in the book, which is why I asked Nadine on, on the show. I also think that there's something to be said for essential oils. And I really don't understand how to use essential oils as a, as a sort of truth disclaimer here. I have lots of them. People give me the very best ones and then I smell them, but I'm not really sure what's going on there. So I have room to grow there. She's also a frequent commentator in like the New York Times, National Post, a Hollywood reporter and all over the place. And Alanis Morissette called her a true sense visionary. So Nadine Artemis, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Now, Give me your story. You've been doing this health and beauty thing since you were 18, but how did that come about? Yeah, it's hard to say where it all began. I feel like it kind of began earlier. I had a lot of exploration in nature and in grade nine, I, I found a book in the library on recreating cosmetics naturally. So for the science fair project at that time, I recreated Laird Tonne using essential oils. Because in that book, I found out that perfumes, I was obsessed with them at that time, but they were all like the commercial stuff, that they actually came from plants. And it went into the ancient Egyptian cosmology of it all. And that was fascinating to me because also my great grandfather used to be the president of the London Egyptology Society and he would go on archaeological digs. So I had all these Egyptian paintings and I was fascinated. So that was sort of my first hit. And then it faded a bit, but back when I was 18, as you and I were just talking about, I was reading some health books on food, and sort of from that moment forward, I realized that the whole structure of the supermarket was fake. And then that also led me to believe and understand that the whole structure of body care was completely fake, and that all my... I was, like, was so excited about the body shop then, because it was just newly invented, and then I realized there was no pineapple in the face wash and no cucumber in the face donor. So I started making my own food, and my own cosmetics. And then by 22, after I graduated, I opened up North America's first full concept aromatherapy store. And I had all of my distillers from all over the world that I would get essential oils from. And I realized there's a quality that's available that wasn't around at the health food stores at that time. So I did that for a long time and I just formulate tons of products. And then when I was about 22, I was started really getting into oral care and dentistry because I found, well, there's a lot of alternative stuff for the body. I found that alternative dentistry, there was a big gap and maybe you could learn about the hazards of mercury, but there wasn't else a lot out there. So then I started formulating some oral care products, um, just mainly testing them on myself and friends. And then, you know, deeply going into oral care after that. And so now we have a huge line of oral care products with ozonated gel and, yeah, you know, and really fancy um, botanical extracts. I like to call them botanical biotics. And then what's so fascinating now is to go into all the research about the mouse microbiome. 
is that what we're finding is that we're getting um, scientific studies that are now confirming that like why everybody had been using these botanical biotics for thousands of years because they're confirming that things like neem, tea tree, frankincense, oregano, cardamom, clove, cinnamon, all those sort of classic ones for oral care, what they're finding now is that they are awesome at inhibiting quorum sensing, which is how pathogens communicate in the mouth or all over the body. So the essential oils are able to clean up the pathogens penetrate biofilms, but not be these indiscriminate assassins that antibiotics are. So you really got into to some of the nuances of what essential oils can do. And you talked about something else really, really important there, which is that you're one of the few people I've seen at a commercial level selling ozonated anything. So let's talk about ozone first, and let, let's talk about essential oils, uh, because the effects on, on the microbiome are, are really important uh, for both of those things. First, well, talk about ozone, what you're ozonating, and why someone would want to put that in their mouth. Well, oh yeah, ozone is amazing. It was, it was invented by, it was Tesla, of course, who's, uh, like, his, his inventions are, are like, they, they're so huge. I mean, from what he, you know what I mean? Like, he, from, he put o oxygen through olive oil, which is, seems so different from everything else he created, but he was the first to do that. And then a lot of naturopaths at the time were putting it into their practice. So what we're doing now is we're ozonating our healthy gumdrop formula. So we have, so we've ozonated not only the, the oil that we do, jojoba olive oil, and then we also ozonate along with it, the sea buckthorn, the rosato, the peppermint. So it's very powerful. And so what ozone does too, is it, it's, it seems to act like there's some beneficial things out there like hydrogen peroxide, salt, baking soda, ozone, the essential oils, what they're all able to clean up, but not destroy the whole microbiome. And I really feel like it's these kind of uh, what botanical biotics, again, or like natural substances that are so important right now because of things like antibiotic resistance and because of things like antibiotics not being able to penetrate biofilms. And what we need in our mouths is, is breathability and oxygen being in there. And then when we have things in our mouth which are pathogenic, like, um, you know, like an old root canal, which we can talk about, but there's definitely things in our mouth that fester and breed bacteria and ozone's able to go in there and clean up. And a lot of dentists will inject sites that they just worked on with ozone as well. It's very regenerative. It it sounds uh, hard to believe for most people listening who probably haven't heard about ozone in the mouth. I, we've talked about ozone with uh, Dr. Rowan, who was actually using it for Ebola, like yeah. intravenous ozone. I actually did some intravenous ozone three days ago with Robin Benson in Santa Fe. And you can do things in your mouth that, that are kind of crazy. I, this was many years ago, every night was drinking a bunch of magnesium citrate, that natural calm, it's this hot acidic drink, it turns out, and I drink it after I brush my teeth, because I like it's a sleep thing, I drink it before bed. And I dissolved most of the enamel in my mouth that way, and didn't really know it. So I went into the dentist, a traditional dentist, and they basically said, oh, you're gonna have to have like bridges everywhere, it's gonna be four appointments of four hours a piece, we're gonna basically rip your whole mouth out, and uh, give you a new one. Huh. And I'm like, good thing I run the Silicon Valley Health Institute, this anti-aging thing, so I went to a resident dentist, um, who uh, unfortunately has since passed away, um, but he was one of the pioneers of ozone dentistry. His name was uh, Dr. Gallagher. So he, he looks at me and goes, oh yeah, problem here. Uh, so he ozonates, he like injects ozone around all my teeth, basically has me kind of rinse my mouth out with ozone to sterilize it. And then he says, great, now go home and brush with this for a week. And it was something called remineralization paste. And magically, <laughs> like, $30,000 worth of like fake teeth disappeared it, with like a $20 tube of paste and like one cent worth of ozone. That is how powerful this stuff is. And literally my teeth are fine to this day. That's amazing. So, well, it's amazing and it's kind of not. <laughs> well, it, it's amazing if, if you don't know that this is possible. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is to talk more about that. And I think we've had uh, Dr. Jennings um, who, who does a alignment but doesn't do ozone. So no one's really talked about that. So you're putting ozone in, in oil, which is something different than injecting the gas. But what is ozone really doing in your mouth? Like, like, like walk me through the steps here. Well, it's able, it, it can rege regenerate. So you're getting new cell growth where you want it. 
And then you're, I think the main thing too, what, what we sort of skipped over because everything that's going on with modern dentistry is about killing this sort of periodontal scorched earth policy on the mouth's microbiome, right? You've got the really heavy duty mouth rinses, the, the, the toothpaste with triclosan and sodium lauryl sulfate and all these chemicals. And then we're masticating meals with glyphosates and pesticides. So our mouths are like this microcosm for the whole, everything that's going on with the world right now. And our microbiomes are literally off balance, like the soil of our mouths, just like the soil of our guts are so out of whack. So ozone can come in, help regenerate, and then also clean up because then what's happening because we're missing microbes. I'm sure you've read Dr. Martin Blazer's work. He has a book, mm -hmm. Missing Microbes. And so he talks a lot about the guts and then how things get out of whack is because the microbes are actually missing some of their ancestral bacterial buddies. So every mouth has streptococcus mutans. It just depends if it's out of control or not. And that's the cavity causing bacteria. And what they now understand from research of the human microbiome, which is really revolutionary, is that streptococcus mutans is a bit out of control because it's missing its bacterial buddies that would keep it under control. And this is because of everything we're you know, killing off all the healthy microbes through our regular oral care practices and because of our diet. So something like ozone can come in and clean up the pathogens, but still keep all the friendly bacteria active and healthy and proliferating. What about hydrogen peroxide? Like hydrogen peroxide and ozone are, are similar. And if, if you're not a biochemist uh, for people listening, the difference is that hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. And so it's got this extra oxygen floating around and ozone is O3 with an extra oxygen floating around. So they both have free oxygen. But what's the difference? Like if you're going to put one or the other in your mouth or somewhere in your body, why wouldn't people just use hydrogen peroxide, which you can buy for two bucks at the drugstore? Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like I'm always the one to do more. I feel like more is merrier. <laughs> um, but hydrogen peroxide is also amazing. But again, you have to use that carefully because it can be quite astringent. And you would want to use it actually at the diluted rate of 1%. Um, and it is really good as a natural whitener. It's not something I recommend to do every day, though, because it can pull back the gums a bit. The gums can get a bit from the astringent reaction and we want to keep our gums really healthy and around each tooth. So I recommend doing it once a month, maybe once a week if you're trying to get the teeth whiter. And a really neat thing that you can do at home is just take like a teaspoon of your diluted 1% hydrogen peroxide and then put a teaspoon of baking soda. Those are loose measurements. And you let you mix that together and you let it evaporate. So you just leave it in a jar and leave it open. It'll evaporate in a few hours. And then you have a dry, very potent sort of back baking soda powder. And then you brush your teeth. I like for this, uh, I like to use two types of toothbrushes, a manual and a round headed electric, just really inexpensive $25 one, because the round head can get back further. And then you're not really focusing on the gums, just gonna focus on the teeth. And then you will polish them. I think of like the janitor that would do the high school, the gym floors, you know, you're just looking at this as like a buffing polishing stage. And that's really good for removing old plaque and getting the teeth white. So it's a good part where hydrogen peroxide can come in. And once again, hydrogen peroxide is able to, you know, handle and tidy up the pathogens without destroying the good bacteria. So, all right, I'm gonna ask you about one of these things that, that I do on occasion, like maybe every three months. Okay. I get food grade diatomaceous earth, which mm -hmm. is incredibly abrasive. And I put a little bit of uh, of the XCT oil we have, nice. which is basically uh, it, it's it has topical like bacterial properties and stuff. But then I use my electric toothbrush and I polish my teeth with that for like ten seconds, and it totally removes all the stains. It hasn't seemed to cause problems in like oh a long time of doing that, uh, and that's similar to the polishing agent that a dentist uses. Is there any reason people shouldn't be doing this because it seems to work? Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea to use clays. I mean, you could even do that same thing and use your activated charcoal product oh, as I, well. I do that too, for sure. It's just the activated charcoal isn't so abrasive. I can do that more often. Yeah. And it, it, it takes the stains off. But the other stuff is it's like it'll get rid of tartar on the back of your teeth if you wanted to. But you also could grind your teeth away if, if you do too much. Yeah, I think because you have the oil with it, though, that's a really good lube. Yeah, it, it's... It's, it's amazing. Like you can do, I don't have the world's whitest teeth naturally. Like I just have like quite brown teeth and 
they're much better than they used to be, but I also don't do a lot of like the laser, I, I, to be honest, like the cosmetic dentistry thing, I, I don't really know all the stuff they do, but like lasers and paint or yeah. Bondo, whatever they do on the front, like like they put fake teeth on top yeah. of them. I haven't done any of that stuff. No. Um, so it's it's interesting though, just to see what you can do naturally. Um, I, I also used, uh, this was a, a while back, I realized it wasn't working, but I used to make my own mouthwash. I'm like, all right, let's kill everything. So I would take uh, vodka. And I would take xylitol, which is something that inhibits bacterial growth in the mouth, and then some essential oils, and I'd shake it up. And I noticed when I would use this, it took me six months to figure it out. When I'd use this, I'd wake up with the world's driest eyes, oh. like super dry eyes. Do you know what's going on there? Because I, I quit doing it for that reason, and there's some other reasons to not do that. But tell me what I was doing wrong there. Well, I do think it's alcohol. And I do think when we're doing mouthwashes, we don't want to use alcohol at all, even yeah. if it's a really Agreed. great alcohol. Because it is drying, and it is shifting the microbiome. Yeah. Why, it, you know, I feel like the mouth is totally connected up to the body. It's very neat that your eyes went dry. You know, I can't totally speak to that on a scientific level, but it's all connected. It, I'm guessing it had something to do with, with nitric oxide. And I read something mm -hmm. about that eventually. Because we have these bacteria in our mouth that make nitric oxide, which causes better circulation. And so th that's my working theory. I have no idea for sure why. I probably never will know. But it was repeatable. I, I could not wow. rinse. And I'd wake up with normal eyes. I could rinse and, th and they would get dry. This is one of those things that you wouldn't think of unless you were one of those walking event correlation engines like me where you just notice stuff and see if they're related. That's what I like to do. <laughs> and what you do, and in fact, you had a, a quote from, uh, from your book where you said, uh, the system of treating symptoms creates a perpetual loop of appointments, medications, surgeries, scrapings, bridges, crowns, and fillings that never reaches the underlying root causes of the symptoms leading to the statistic that 90% of 60 year olds will have 63% of their teeth missing, filled or decayed. So, so it's kind of like the eating a low fat diet. <laughs> Everyone gets fat doing that, but we just keep doing it. And now you're saying that 90% of 60 year olds who do what their dentist said, which is floss and brush with these chemicals and put fluoride all over the place, that basically more than half your teeth are gonna break by the time you're only 60, which is like a third of what you, where you should be living if you're you know, under 60 now and you're planning to, you know, you're in good health and you're planning to live a long time. We have technology now. Yes. Well, it's totally insane. And then it also shows like if, if you had followed through with that dental appointment. So, I mean, it's not like every one of those 60 year olds had the decayed tooth that came out. A lot of them would have been removed through just modern dentistry. And there's a, a couple of good um, investigative journalist reports. I mean, I think there should be more, but one Canadian with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation had her teeth checked at the University of Toronto and she only needed one crown on one tooth. And she went across Canada to 20 dentists and the quotes Ooh. range from like 300 to like every, like getting veneers on each tooth and getting root canals. So that was crazy. And then another gentleman in, um, in the US uh, had another dental examination and actually all he needed was a crown replaced in his tooth. He went to 50 dentists. He showed them the same x-rays at every single one. And again, the quotes range from 700 to $19,000 from oh crowning God. every single tooth to root canals and bridges and all that kind of stuff. And actually 15 of those 50 dentists missed the molar that needed to be crowned entirely. So I think it also shows us that while we think dentistry is very black and white and it's scientific and lab coats and sterilization and all, and that x-ray, x-ray is like, you know, the golden like image that we're like, that's, that's the image that everybody's supposed to interpret. But all these things are completely you can take the same x-ray and have 50 interpretations. I think that's really good for our minds to sort of like know so we can undo because when you're at the dentist, you just think they, they know everything. And actually when the American Dental Association responded to this journalist who went to the 50 dentists, they weren't surprised by the inconsistencies because they explained that dentistry is an art based on scientific information. So I thought that was a really interesting quote. Well it, it's a fair point too. Medicine's the same way. Yeah. Like you, you go to different healers and dentists are healers and you go to different healers and they use different techniques. They've been trained in, in different traditions. They have different tool sets. So it, it's, it's reasonable that you wouldn't see exactly the same thing every time, but the variance there seems pretty horrifying. 
Yeah. And then, you know, you can mix in things like insurance or if somebody had, you know, because a lot of, he, he was asked a lot if he had insurance. So then a different billing thing. And so there's definitely influences, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it, yeah. I do think it just, it's good for people to know because if your dentist says you do need a root canal, you may, but you also may not. And so I think it, we're going to need a dentist at some point in our lives. And sometimes we need them to undo previous dental work. So it's so important to have a very leading edge dentist, one that uses ozone. You know, there's even dentists now that use the plate, the plasma, the PRP therapy. You know, sometimes that yeah. you might have heard of that for I, joints. Well, I just did it. I just did it three days ago in my knees. Oh, there you so. go. You had a busy three <laughs> days. So there, yeah. if they remove a root canal or if there's a receding gum issue, they'll inject the, your own plasma and then you're mm -hmm. healing that area for six months. And I, like, that's amazing. And stem cell tooth regrowth is probably still about four or five years away. They have done it successfully in pigs. So it's only a matter of time. I'm, I'm not sure that most people listening know the dangers of root canals. Uh, I've been fortunate I haven't had to have one, but can you talk about why, why they're such a big deal? And I, I think traditional dentistry doesn't really talk much about them. It's like, oh, you just need one. Yeah. But like, what are the risks of root canal? Why, why do alternative practitioners talk so much about root canals? Because they all do. They do. And it, they are, it's a, re it's really interesting when you go into it. Um, and there actually is now in Odon in endontics journals, which, which is not anything we're all going to be reading. And most dentists don't read them, but they're now discussing that, yes, it is impossible to sterilize a tooth through a root canal. So that's very exciting, but that information doesn't filter down. So the whole goal of a root canal is to take a, an infected tooth and then um, they scrape out the whole pulp chamber and the nerves. So it's like scraped out, um, but you're still keeping the cosmetic appearance that you have a tooth in your mouth and it is your tooth, but actually it's a dead tooth. And because no, um, now the blood supply has been taken out of the tooth, what happens is then that becomes a little necrotic nest festering with pathogenic bacteria that, you know, every time you chew gets squeezed out and into your body and um, no blood can get there. And so you basically have a full anaerobic setup for this bacteria. Um, so what they found is this can cause issues in people. Dr. Joseph Isels, who's in, a physician in Europe who's been working with cancer patients for 40 years, has found that 96% of all people with, uh, well, all women with breast cancer have a root canal on the same side. So that doesn't mean if you have a root canal, you're going to get breast cancer, but women with breast cancer had a root canal on the same side. And also for his man, male and female patients, he asked them to remove the root canal before they start their treatment because he feels like it's this thing that's like, like just challenging the autoimmune system so much that somebody can't fully heal. One of my most respected dentist, dentist friends is Dr. Stuart Nunnally. He's in Texas. And he did the first independent lab study of root canals. So he, extra the, the, the root canal tooth had to be textbook perfect, not causing the person any, any issues. Cause some, sometimes you can have a root canal and then you're like a few years later, you're like, oh, it's really hurting. So they had to be perfect. They had to show zero pathology on an x-ray. And then if, if it qualified that way, they removed the tooth and then they had independent dentists select the teeth that could go to the lab to have DNA testing. And what they found is that every single extracted tooth had pathology and it had severe necrotic bacteria. You know, obviously that range. So some people had higher levels of severe bacteria, but the interesting thing too, is they also found like older diseases, like they found things like um, syphilis, leprosy, the bacteria for that and Lyme disease was also found. So hopefully you don't have to get a root canal People often ask them, what are the choices? And the best choice is to actually, if, if the tooth really is a candidate for root canal, you'll actually want to get it extracted if it's already okay. far gone. But you do want to get it extracted properly, um, which means that the, the periodontal ligament also has to be removed. So you'd have to go to a really good dentist for that that also knows this. Because then if the periodontal ligament is left in, then 10 years, 20 years down the road, you could have a jaw cavitation, which is where the jaw bone starts to rot. So that's how you would want to clean up a root canal. Now, if it's a back molar, you can just let that be and, and actually have the space in your mouth. 
if it's a front tooth or something, you know, that's that's a hard decision to make because then you are looking at things like bridges. Um, you know, there are implants, but you definitely don't want titanium implanted into your body. Um, there is better. It seems like they're, in Europe they're using a zirconium implant, which is helpful. So why Why would you not want titanium in your body? Because <laughs> it's a heavy. I thought it was hypoallergenic. Yeah. <laughs> it's hypo, maybe hypoallergenic, but it's, you know, heavy metal. And heavy metal, Dr. Hal Huggins always called any heavy metal the marriage of microbes and metal. So he found that any microbes in the body just love to feed off the heavy metals and the titanium can rot. My husband had a titanium root canal and we got that pulled out. And it was gnarly when they showed us the tooth. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting. My wife and I used to run a lab testing company in the U.S. Oh, cool. that would test for white blood cell proliferation in response to environmental things, including oh. titanium. Wow. And we found that about 10% of people would make white blood cells when their blood was exposed to titanium. We're using a radioactive cell counter. And we also found that most titanium isn't actually titanium. If it's less oh. than 2% another metal, they don't have to tell you what's in there. So there can be nickel, there can be other toxic metals in these things. So we had a, a number of, of uh, people who were customers of this lab test who got surgery, got titanium and got sick and never got better until it was removed, including like an eight year old where he was gonna die from, from this. He had a, a huge thing in his chest. And we ended up getting a compassionate exemption from the FDA to import zirconium. So this was like eight years ago and it certainly saved his life. And, and the whole point here is that titanium may be harmless for someone, but it is not risk-free by a long shot. And it's not just titanium, it's titanium and some other things that they might tell you about if you call and ask. And so what I, I would recommend you do there is you get zirconium if you can afford it and you can find a way to do it, or maybe ceramic or something like that. Because yes. anytime you put metal in there, like, like there's, there's that risk. And then there's the electrical current risk where you make a battery. When you have one one piece of metal somewhere in your body and a different type of metal somewhere else and water between them, you generate a current and those currents compete with the currents that are in your body. So it's really it's complex so right. and most people don't know this. Yeah, and that currents you can get with the mercury fillings as well. And even porcelain, it's good that you brought up metal purity because even the porcelain fillings, which people like, you know, they think, okay, it's, they're trying to do the right thing and they spend more on the better on the better filling but it is got it's got nickel in it as well so it's not a pure metal I and, didn't know that yeah and nickel is one of the most carcinogenic um, metals but then you've also brought up a point like for some people titanium is okay but then it, I think it all depends on you know the constitution of that individual their microbiome their DNA so you know what's lining up with that that's just what like some people can have mercury, mercury fillings and they kind of can function with it. While other people, it might lead to something like some severe autoimmune issue. So it's all depending on the terrain of the body that's meeting that titanium metal. So, so by now we've got people going, oh no, I have root oh, no. canals. Uh, like, is it the end of the world? Um, there's one of the reasons you might want to pay attention to that. And then let's talk about what they can do about it, like who to go to. But yeah. The, so I'm very skeptical about all of this stuff, at least I was, but I've seen enough of it um, in my own experience personally and just with, with clients and just in the world around me uh, in anti-aging and all, um, that I, I'm not skeptical about it anymore. But if you go to an acupuncturist or a, a, an aware holistic dentist, you'll see a map of which teeth line up to which organs. And now the, the Western side of that's like, what a bunch of superstitious religious BS. But then you go back to what happens in the womb and you realize, oh, wait, like each of these teeth is plugged into the nervous system. In fact, the front four teeth are derived from your neural uh, stem cells, like they're plugged into your nervous system even more so than than others. So if you have a problem with one of your front four teeth, it affects you neurologically. And these maps, mostly from Chinese acupuncture, are pretty accurate. If there's a liver problem, this tooth is going to be more sore. And it sounds crazy, except there's actually evidence for it. And I, I noticed that, especially when I was a raw vegan. I, I would get this incredible tooth pain uh, and, and cold sensitivity and all that would map to specific areas in the body. And it's just kind of weird, but you could put a laser on that part of the body and the tooth would stop hurting. And like, what's going on with this? And I don't think it's all psychosomatic. There's, there's method to the madness. So, so that said. Uh, by the way, do you ascribe to that, to that theory? Absolutely. The, I have that okay. chart in my book. 
Uh, so there you go. There. Like I haven't. Seen, I don't remember that page. It's um, but early okay. On. Okay. Uh, so, so this may be completely news to to you if you're listening to this, and that's okay because a lot of people just don't talk about this, or it just seems like too mystical. It's not mystical at all. It's just repeatable. <laughs> and when when you look at what's going to happen when you go to the dentist, how should people find a dentist? Like, let's say you want to get checked out. You want to see if you have safe fillings. You want to see if those root canals are are festering and harboring all sorts of, of stuff in them. How do you find a dentist who's going to be able to have the level of conversation that, that we're talking about? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know what? They really do exist. Sometimes you might have to travel for them. One of the first things to do I, I like to recommend is call the Hal Huggins Institute because they will also they have a list of biological dentists in your area that have trained with Hal Huggins. They've learned protocols. But that doesn't mean because I know like I've also called some of those dentists. So they're not all leading, leading edge, but they've at least got a good start. But then what you have to do is call that dentist, that dentist's office, and then speak to the dentist and ask questions. In my book, and actually I have a free article on our website, which is all the questions you need to ask a prospective dentist to really see if they're very leading edge. But, you know, for example, for example, Dr. Nunnally in Texas, people fly in all over the world to see him. And then recently I talked to another dentist who's in Canada and she's so into remineralization and she really gets it that she's not even filling teeth anymore because she really believes that if she empowers people to do so, she won't need to fill teeth. And she does phone consults with people all over the world and video calls and you can send her your x-rays and then talk about it. So I love that even as a first step and like finding out like, you know, my friend's five-year-old went to a normal pediatrician dentist. They were like, you know, we're going to have to put her under general anesthetic. She needs four root canals and like nine mercury crowns. Wow. Nine mercury crowns this day and age because they're easier. Mercury's easier to place on children anyway. Wow. Uh, so she took those x-rays and called the dentist and, you know, totally different story when you're working with another dentist. And, and then another really good dentist is in Alberta. They use ozone, PRP. They actually buy our ozonated gel and sell it at cost just to like, so that people can afford, like just, you know, they, they have a very great uh, practice and they even have the like lowest costing dentist pra dental practice in, in Alberta. So they're awesome. Can't remember the name right now, but um, you can always put it up later. But, and they, they took the time to talk to my client for half an hour, you know? So I just feel like when you're really finding the right dentist, they're so passionate. And I really feel that a dentist that really is leading edge won't even perform a root canal because they wow. really get the pathology of it. Um, if you don't want to remove a root canal, because also that is invasive as well, um, a lot of dentists will maintain it with the PRP injections and ozone, or perhaps it's not a convenient time to take it out. Maybe you're still, you know, maybe you want to get pregnant soon and I wouldn't necessarily mess around. So you might just want to you know, inject it with ozone and, and just maintain the immune system that way. Um, so that that's a, a really good answer. And we'll put links to those in the show notes so people can uh, can find that. It really matters which dentist you go to. What about fluoride? What's, what's your take on that? Well, fluoride, I mean, I think the evidence is out there. If you look, there's I mean, the side effects are crazy. Side effects are like receding gums, crumbling bones. Uh, you know, it messes up with your collagen synthesis. It makes your IQ lower from a Harvard study. So, I mean, the, the information is so out there. It's not good at all. I mean, that's the bottom line. It just is not good. It crumbles your teeth. And then people have like, I think what, what we're not understanding too with dentistry is that what most dentists don't know is that there's a dentineal lymph system so every tooth has a lymphatic fluid and that's totally connected with our, it's connected to the parotid glands, to the hypothalamus. Of course, everything goes back to the hypothalamus. So through the hypothalamus, activating the parotid glands that are activated when you're chewing nutritive food, this information goes down into digestion, comes back up into the teeth. So that's where the roots, just like tree roots, will draw up nutrients into the tooth, into the pulp chamber, then it goes out onto the tooth enamel where it coalesces with the saliva to remineralize the teeth, to keep the microbiome healthy. And if a cavity is beginning to start, then it will, it will activate so that more saliva goes to that area. Now, when we're eating a diet high in sugar, we're having blood sugar spikes, 
uh, you know, eating a low fat diet devoid of fat soluble vitamins of A, of A D, three and K2. And when we don't have enough minerals in our diet, what happens is this lymph system stagnates or even worse, it can actually reverse. And this is how a cavity is formed. So when it reverses, when the dentineal lymph system reverses, the capillaries in the tooth begin to suck in bacteria and everything else in the mouth like a straw. So rather than the, this toroidal system of the nutrients coming up into the teeth, it reverses and then the teeth draw in bacteria into the tooth and that's how that's the genesis of cavity creation so when we go back and we think about things like fluoride antibiotics and um, even chlorine right if you're brushing your teeth with chlorine all of these things affect the systemic connection that's actually supposed to nourish our teeth and through there you can get crumbling teeth i'm sure you you might know about cipro or tetracycline yeah. that makes the teeth gray and actually through the fluoroquinolone antibiotic group teeth are crumbling out of the mouth so, so th those are fluoride containing antibiotics for people yes. who, who haven't come across those before uh, and they're known for staining your teeth as well and not to mention causing bigger problems yeah. now i think we've talked a lot about teeth and how foundational they are if someone came to you and said, all right, I have, a, I have a little cavity in my kid, what would you tell them to do? Or I don't know if they, they yeah. came to you or came to consult with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, we cannot treat or diagnose anybody. But of course, my own kid, <laughs> I would really look at diet, keeping blood sugar low below 80, amping up the fats. Um, in, blood sugar always below 80, even after eating? Like, well, eat, uh, like let's say about 80. Maybe you're blood fasting. Fasting blood sugar. Fasting blood sugar. Oh, exactly. okay. Got it. That's got the it. right word. Um, so not having these spikes. And then really looking at minerals because through the work of Dr. Weston Price, Dr. Ralph Steinen, who discovered the dentineal flow, he found that if we up um, magnesium and phosphorus alone, the decay rate goes down by 80%. And Dr. Melvin Page found that when phosphorus gets too low in the blood serum, cavities begin to form. So I would look at all that stuff with diet for remineralizing the tooth. And then I would be working with the mouth microbiome. I would be applying the serums and um, you know, brushing the teeth, but act, but literally pouring on like you know the serums with all those botanical biotics in them every day. But you wouldn't fill the tooth. No, I would. I wouldn't fill the tooth unless it got to a really. But hopefully, what you can do at that point is you can. Um, a cavity is active when it's mushy, so that's how a dentist checks if their if their instrument is getting mushy, going right into the thing. So. Um, even in dental textbooks, it, it talks like in their dental textbooks at school that you can, like a cavity can be halted. So once you fill the tooth, you have no other option. And then that can be a, like a, what do you call that? Slippery slope. Because as you all know, some of you may have had fillings, but then 20 years later, you're getting a crown. And when they have to do fillings, even though there are things with lasers now, and there's a lot of improvements, they're drilling away healthy tooth. So once you have a filling, and then also no filling is perfect. There are better ones, there are ceramic ones, there are lots of there's zirconium ones, but you're putting something in the body that has BPA, aluminum, you know, there's all those issues. So if you can get the tooth to remineralize, just like you were able to remineralize your teeth, I think what you can see is that the mouth is actually alive. It's connected to our blood system. It's collect, connected to digestion, the actual core of the tooth. And so when we can get the body activated, then we can prevent cavities. Because if we, if we just put a filling on it, then we're not actually addressing what caused the cavity in the, first, in the first place. And then the child in another year might have a few more. So I think it's really good to address it and do all you can to remineralize the tooth. Because that's basically what it means, is that the tooth is losing its mineral source. Okay, that's a, that's a pretty strong statement. You you wouldn't you wouldn't fill the cavity most of the time, or you wouldn't you know, recommend that your child had it filled. That's um, it, that's possible. Absolutely. And for people listening, most people hearing this right now had no idea that you could you know, halt or reverse a cavity. So I think that's really cool to understand. And your book explained the lymphatic flow in the tooth really really well, which was cool. Yeah. Let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about the other thing that you do, which is not just teeth, but it, it's beauty. And you are one of the other few people talking about vitamin D sulfate. I had Stephanie Seneff, who's one of the big fans of that on the show recently, and we talked about how you need sunlight 
to make vitamin D sulfate, but you're talking about it from a beauty perspective. So what is vitamin D3 sulfate and why do I need it for beautiful skin? Nice question. And I love that podcast, by the way. Um, And I love her work. She's so awesome. Um, Well, we need it. It's like so, because if you think about beauty, I mean, generally we think about avoiding the sun. I think that's what we've got going on in this modern age. But we need it because it actually, it juices up the body in so many ways. And our skin was literally designed to be exposed to the sun's rays. So we can't just, you know, take vitamin D and ignore the sun. We need our vitamin D uh, and we need the kind that we make with our blood. So when the sunbeams touch our skin, we make the vitamin D3 sulfate, which is water soluble. And all the supplements are fat soluble. So when we have that coursing through our body, you know, then we have health and vitality and beauty and we're preventing lots of things from happening. What's also important is that we have thousands of vitamin D receptors all over our body and in places where the sun doesn't shine. And when those vitamin D receptors are not filled with vitamin D3, then what happens is bacterial lingens come in. There's these sticky bacteria and they literally shut down the immune system. So um, we need to be brimming with the sunshine vitamin and we need to like start early in the spring if you're in a non-tropical climate, you know, suntan up until about solar noon, try and get 20 minutes an hour in, flip, you know, and um, what actually causes hyperpigmentation and wrinkles, you know, it's a few things, but literally what's, what's really bad is when you're eating a diet high in polyunsaturated fatty acids yep. and then being in the sun and applying the sunscreen, which, you know, doesn't allow us to absorb vitamin D at all. And it separates the UV ray from the UVB rays. And what I think we're finding in some scientific research is that it's the UVA separated that is also a little more sun damaging. So let's say if you're always driving and then the sun's hitting the side of your cheek, you're getting through the window is causing the separation of the UVA and the UVB and we need them together. So sunscreen separates, windows separate. So we need them together. And then what's also happening when you're wearing sunscreen is you're, you're turning off your alarm clock that's saying, I have been in the sun too long, you know? So we've got to build up our melanin and, um, and these things prevent, uh, the, the hyperpigmentation and all the aging. So I think it's actually totally anti-aging to be in the sun and where you're really seeing aging happen fast is with like the PUFAs, the polyunsaturated fatty acids and, um, glycation, which is when you're eating basically, I mean, really simply put is just eating a lot of sugar or having spiked blood sugar levels. And back in the 20s, they talked, there was a lot of talk about how the sun created like beautiful skin, prevented acne. You know, I, it, it, I think it really just works with the microbiome and having our skin's microbiome be fully functional. Now, with, uh, with teeth, you talked about breast cancer. Yeah. And with beauty and skin, is there a connection to breast cancer? Like what should women do specifically to avoid that? Well, I think, yeah, as a, as a, I love talking about breast health as well. Um, because uh, I, me, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why not? Um, I feel like there's a lot of connection there. That's why I always feel like there's a lot of patterns that are connected. Of course, um, there's a lot of studies like by Dr. Garland that show like fit, when, you're, when you have vitamin D levels brimming, you're 50% less likely to get breast cancer. I think other things that's showing up, what they found when they analyzed uh, cancerous breast tissue is that um, 100% of the breast cancer tissue had mercury. 98% had ascomycete fungus in the breast tissue and 99% had parabens. So I feel like it's a whole mix of things like lack of vitamin D, exposure to molds and grains and peanuts and food. And then with the parabens, we've got, you know, deodorants and all the pounds of cosmetics that women apply every year. And that stuff just doesn't leave the body and it stores up in our breasts. And then why the breasts are a little more susceptible, like why is it not happening in our elbow, is because then we're often wearing bras, which is creating this lymphedema in this area. And a lot of breast cancer is actually happening in the lateral part, which is really the armpit. 
What's lymphedema for people who don't know that term? It's like the lymph just becomes a stagnant cesspool, basically, and it's not doing its job of like uh, circulating and taking, removing sort of the pollution from the body. So you get like a little stagnant cesspool and the breast, and then the breast is really rich with fat and connective tissue, so it can store up a lot of toxins. And so I just feel like our modern lifestyle of no sun, wearing bras, and you know, mercury, and then tons of cosmetics and bathing in chlorine and fluoride. And all of this is creating this thing that are making our breasts a barometer really showing us, you know, things aren't necessarily balanced right now in the world. It's interesting that you brought up that fungal connection to cancer. Uh, There are hundreds and hundreds of studies talking about the connection between mold and the toxins mold makes and different types of fungi and, and cancer. And it's not all cancer is that, but there are people, countless people who take potent antifungal drugs and have their cancer uh, resolve. And every chemo chemical they use is an antifungal on top of all the other things it does. Oh. Like it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. And so I'm not saying cancer is caused by fungus. I'm just saying that there are times when it's a major contributing factor and there are some times when it is caused by fungus. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like what, you know, from other doctors, what they they do show, I mean, the cancer cells act like fungal spores. You know, they, they love sugar. They love, you know, no oxygen. And they eat their way through connective tissue the same way. The fungus and the cancer, they kind of behave similar. Let's talk about collagen, which is another thing for beautiful skin. What can people do to have healthy collagen in their skin? Like, what's its role in the skin? What do you do to keep it there? Well, of course, they can eat your supplement, <laughs> which is oh, great. Okay. <laughs> well, I wasn't fishing for a plug well, there, but I, I was appreciated. It is the way, because there it is. <laughs> and I think it's a great thing to add to smoothies and everything. Um, again, I mean, really, I love, whenever I'm thinking about anything for the body, I'm really looking about like how I can do the least amount and create the most maximizing situation. Because I'm actually like, I don't like Like I like to just have it so simple. So what can I do that my body is self-regenerating all on its own? That's the way I like to do it. So I feel like if I'm going to eat anyway, I might as well be eating the best food because that's obviously going to contribute to beauty and anti-aging and to my teeth health and all that. So I really feel like we have to eat, you know, good amounts of protein, good amounts of amino acids because the collagen is like a lattice work and it's holding up all the tissue in the body. And when skin starts starts to sag, then we it means we've lost some collagen in our body. But what's also interesting is that there's these enzymes that are not good, because I mean, I usually associate the word enzyme as a positive thing, but they're kind of these negative enzymes. And they're, they eat the collagen and the elastin in the body. And so um, what's good thing about essential oils is they have they show that they are they they inhibit those enzymes from eating away the collagen and the elastin. So I think that's a huge beauty secret as well. And you just rub the essential oils on the skin, basically. Yeah, I mean, or... which I, so you, they, an essential oil, even though it has the word oil in it, it is not oily at all which is fine for a lot of applications. If you're doing something acute or if you have a cut or a burn, I would just be putting on like peppermint or frankincense straight on because I want to clean it and get the skin going back over. Now, once it's all closed up, then I'll be diluting that with a jojoba or virgin coconut oil or the MCT oil. And um, and then you're just applying that to your body like as you would. So you're going to be, generally we apply moisture to our body anyway to help the lipid barrier. So if you're going to be doing that anyway, you just, again, using essential oils with the fat because like, I mean, if you eliminate everything and just use coconut oil, that's like amazing because you will just eliminate a whole bunch of chemicals from your life. But then if you want to like take it to the next level, upgrade it and then really activate that, then you're going to want to add the essential oils because then you're getting like the active properties and the things that actually regenerate cells, repair the cells. And essential oils also show in different studies that they're able to, um, inhibit the pathways, which I can't remember the exact word, Maybelline, I think the pathways that basically where the cells, the cells start acting abnormally. So the essential oils inhibit that activity in the body and they strengthen connective tissue. And I just feel like every year there's more and more as, as, as science studies essential oils that they're just, you know, they're so awesome. 
Well, Nadine, thanks for, for coming on Bulletproof Radio. We're coming up on the end of the show, and, and there's a question that I'm really curious to ask you about, and that's based on all the stuff that you know, which is pretty broad, teeth and, and skin and beauty and, and things like that, and all the other things you've learned, what are your top three recommendations for someone who'd come to you and say, Nadine, I want to do better at everything. I, I want to kick more ass. What are the three most important things I need to know? Well... Yeah, it's like, do I take that? Do I answer philosophically or like scientifically? I feel you can like do both. I can do both. You have, you have three answers. Okay, I feel like on a level of like living, you want to like listen to those early childhood fascinations and curiosities, and go with those strengths. So you want to focus on your strengths. And on a living level. I think it so goes back to like every morsel that we ingest is important. It's either feeding you or it's like taking away from your health. So really maximize out on the best, purest, everything that you're going to be ingesting and have fun with it. I mean, we are so hardcore pure, but we eat the best things every day, you know, from ice cream to whatever. It's like so good. And, and whenever anybody comes over, they're like delighted to eat the crazy food that we do. So maximize out on purity because there's enough in our lives that we can't control, <laughs> like air, that kind of thing, yep. you know? So um, maximize on purity and then and maximize on purity on what you're applying to your skin. So what you're bathing in, what you're, you know, showering in, and then what's going on topically. And through there, I think you know, life will be pretty smooth. <laughs> well, thank you for that answer. And thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio. Where can people find out more about your book and about your website? And basically, where do people find you? Well, uh, the book's on our website and Amazon. And our website is livinglibations.com. And of course, you know, we've got all the regular channels like Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Excellent. So we'll put all those in the show notes so people can... Uh, can get an understanding of where to find you and I'll just come check it out. And while you're at it, if you go to the transcript of this, and this is one of the few podcasts like it where we pay someone to go through and type every one of these words and we use technology and all that, but you can actually read everything that was here. We're also the first uh, radio podcast of anywhere to use a technology called Search Point which means you can go into the transcript, you can click on anything, and we'll take you directly to a 30 second clip on YouTube, which means mm -hmm. if you wanna share just a little snippet of the conversation, you can do that. So it's, it's remarkable that you can just go there and say, all right, this isn't just like what I copied and pasted, this is actually what they said and how they said it, and you can basically just go to exactly that part in, in the technology. That's pretty cool, I'm really happy to be like the first beta customer for that. And the final thing that you might be interested in knowing is if you saw me kind of rocking back and forth a little bit, this is the Bulletproof Sleep Induction Mat, which is uh, full of these little spiky things. And I've been standing on it one, one leg or the other for most of the podcast because it stimulates all these acupressure and acupuncture points on your feet. In addition to helping you go to sleep faster, Sleep Induction Mat is on the Bulletproof website. Thanks again for listening to Bulletproof Radio this time. You know where to find us. Go out to iTunes and click uh, like on there. Or leave a comment. I really, really appreciate that. And we actually read all the comments and I'll do my best to take it to heart, whatever you've got to say. Have a great day.